Hello, everybody. Did you enjoy your lunch? Okay, great. So, um, <clears throat> as I said in this morning, we have uh, 269 people, and uh, I will say some career, and you raise your hand if it, that's you, okay? So, if you from a research background and you are a scholar, please raise your hand. Okay, so if you from the civic tech organization, please raise your hand. Yay. And uh, if you from the traditional civil society, NGO, activist, please raise your hand. Yes, nice. And uh, if you from the government officials, you work for the government. Nice. <laughs> Billy there, okay. <laughs> and uh, policy maker. Who is policy maker? Okay, good. And uh, storyteller, journalist, media, yes. And uh, hackers, come on. Yes, we all hackers. Okay, so as you can see, we have a very diverse uh, audience here. So uh, they came here to learn from each other, learn from your experience, and learn from your wisdoms. So um, before we started, I have something to announce. The first thing is about the travel, uh, about the city sign. If you want to uh, visit some uh, tour at uh, Thursday, you have to go down one floor and make a registration, okay? Make a check. And even you already did that online. If you didn't show in person, they will cancel it. And also, um, the unconference. Yes, unconference board is outside, uh, in the outside. You have to make it um, before 6 o'clock. And on the share note, our volunteer have very, very tired for the share note. So please, if you already taking note, on your own computer, don't be shy to share to the whole audience, okay? And um, let's welcome uh, our digital minister, Audrey Tan, and uh, also Stephen King from the Omedia Network. Um, hello, everyone, uh, and I'm very happy to uh, be sitting here with uh, Stephen, Mr. Stephen King, partner at Omedia Network, and I'm very happy to see that since we've tweeted uh, this conversation, there's a lot of named and anonymous questions already appearing on Slido. So uh, for this conversation, uh, if you have your phone or any internet connecting devices, please uh, uh, navigate to slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter today's date, 911, which communicates the urgency of this dialogue. <laughs> and, 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 and just, just fire away your questions and uh, we will uh, have people vote on the question that you want to see answered. Uh, the ones with the most votes appear to the top. And so, uh, and Stephen will begin with maybe three minutes of conversation of a, a general description of what a media network is and what the initiatives around governance and participation is doing. And then uh, I will just read aloud the questions that appear on Slido here. So without further ado, please uh, give a hand. Thank you, um, Audrey. And um, first of all, thanks everybody for inviting me here to speak. And I want to say a particular thank you to the people from my society and also the Open Culture Foundation who've put on, I think, what promises to be a hugely exciting event over the next couple of days. I'm certainly going to spend as much time as I can um, here and, and meeting people. I also see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, so really good to see many investees from um, a media network as well. So you're very welcome. Um, so what I wanted to do, first of all, for those of you who don't know anything about a media network, is just literally give you two or three minutes on what we, who we are, what we do, and why we think civic tech is, is such a priority. And then we can get on to the questions and the more sort of informal um, stuff as well. So um, a media network is what's called a philanthropic investment firm. And that's quite an unusual term. Um, it's both a philanthropic foundation and it's also a venture capital firm as well. So we are unusual um, in philanthropy circles in that we both make for-profit investments in companies that have a social impact, um, and we can talk a little bit more about some of those examples um, during this session. But then we also um, make, give grants like a traditional philanthropic foundation. 
We were set up by Pierre Amidiav, who's the founder of eBay. And so Pierre, when he first embarked on his journey in philanthropy, was very much, um, he's a technologist, he's a computer scientist um, um, by, by training and profession. Um, and when he um, floated eBay and obviously um, came into the, the wealth and resources that he now, now enjoys, wanted to um, make sure that technology was very much at the heart of what he was supporting, but also that it shouldn't end there. And I see one of the questions that came up in the, um, in, in, in the Slido, which was talking about, you know, is, is funding tech really any, any, any use at all? Shouldn't we be funding sort of policy and advocacy organizations? And we can come on to talk a little bit more about that um, during the course of, of the next hour or so. But I think Pierre's contention was that technology is not a silver bullet, but it's certainly something that can help to um, improve people's lives, to put people in contact with each other and so on. Now we also may at the moment have a, a wider discussion about is social media a good thing? Because I think there's a lot of discussion at the moment as to, you know, with the, the increase in misinformation, hate speech, the sort of e e echo um, and, and sort of filter bubbles and, and sort of echo chambers that we see emerging, um, is that social media has its equal part in in helping to spread misinformation and hate speech at the same time as putting people together around common interests and so on. So um, we give grants and we make investments, essentially. And we do this in five main areas, education, financial inclusion, helping people to get access to capital, um, helping people with property and land rights, um, an interest in technology for social good as a horizontal. Then the area which I'm responsible for worldwide is around governance and citizen engagement. Um, and within that, civic technology plays a really important part. To give you a, a, a sense of the scale, across the media network over the last 10 years, we've invested about $1.2 billion. 50% um, of that has been grants, and 50% of that has been for-profit equity investments. <clears throat> In the governance and citizen engagement um, part of the work, we've invested about $260 million, and about $130 million of that, so 50% of that, has been for civic tech projects projects. And that's worldwide. Um, we've done a fair amount of funding in the US, we've done a fair amount of funding in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia, in Latin America as well. So we'll come on to talk, I think, about some of the examples of that, but we see this as a really important sector um, which is really driving social impact, and that's why we're backing it um, so forcefully. Um, we also want others to join us. I mean, sometimes we feel a little lonely in our funding world because, as you know, as you look for funding yourselves, there aren't a great deal of, of donors out there who are supporting this kind of work, which we think is a pity. Um, we try as much as we can to, to mobilize other donors to convince them that this sector can have impact. Um, so that's something we really want to try and encourage, both at a national level um, and also regional and international um, as well. Um, so I'll s stop there, um, and then we can get on to questions. We're in Audrey's um, capable hands in terms of, um, of how we run this and so on. So I'll turn it over to you again, Audrey. All right. <coughs> so thank you. That was a, a great overview. And uh, for the sake of digital inclusion, if you don't have a uh, internet connecting device with you, please ask the person sitting next to you to send me your questions and or raise your hand or without raising your hand, uh, start asking questions in, in any order. Uh, but yeah, clearly 13 people want to want to know why bother funding tech in the first place? Because uh, as you said, uh, this is a systemic issue and there are many people working in advocacy groups who are not necessarily technologists who nevertheless did a lot of good work. So why, why tech in the civic tech? Sure. Um, I mean, I think this is not an either or question. It's a both question. Um, and I think probably when we go back to the start of our work as, as funders, we were a little naive. Um, I think there was a kind of element, um, and I, I ex hopefully exclude myself from this because I'm not from Silicon Valley, but from my colleagues um, on the West Coast, there was a sort of what we call the kind of shiny-eyed Silicon Valley enthusiasm about, you know, tech will change the world, we do need to do nothing else but give people the tools um, and the platforms will sort everything out. And that, you know, quite palpably isn't true. So I think what we have 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 sort of matured in our approach over the last couple of years to look at sector level change as being the ultimate um, goal of our work. And we also recognize that technology, as I said at the very beginning, is a part of that. 
I think it can connect people around common interests. It can drive innovation. Platforms allow people to communicate with governments much more quickly and easily and to get immediate and more transparent responses, as many of you in this room are, are working on. Um, but also the, the hard work of, of advocacy and of policy making is stuff that really drives change. So I think it's not an either or, it's both. Um, and we support a number of pure policy organizations in the various sectors that we work in. So ones that really are neophytes as far as technology is concerned. But what they have are fantastic ideas, good ways of mobilizing people and communities, and they're able to um, get change happen in, in a perhaps more conventional way. I think what the ideal um, marriage that, that we sometimes seek to see is where you have technologists and media and policy organizations and so on. I'll give you one example from Mexico, which is um, a think tank that we've supported called IMCO, which um, there's a Spanish acronym for it, but it's the Mexican um, Institute for Competitiveness. It does a lot of research, does work on open data and so on. Um, and the Mexican government at that time was chair of the Open Government Partnership. So this was a couple of years ago. Um, and so they were obliged to release a lot of data about um, teachers' salaries and around educational performance and so on. So the people at IMCO, the, the, um, both a combination of data scientists and policymakers, scraped all this education data and surprise, surprise, they found that more than 4,500 teachers all shared the same birth date, which was the 31st of December 1912. So they're all drawing salaries and they're all 102 years old. Um, and then they also found that there were more than 70 um, uh, teachers on the payroll, primary school teachers, um, who earned more than the Mexican president. So there was massive corruption going on. So they were policy um, ad advocates. They also um, got this story out through um, combining with mainstream media as well. So I think what you see in that, that kind of situation is you need the data scientists, you need the technologists, you need the tools to, to scrape from, from those sites and to, to analyze them. You also need the, the policy makers and the advocates, and you also need mainstream media as well to, to try and get the story out. So in answer to the question, I think it's, it really is worth funding tech, but it doesn't mean that we fund tech to the exclusion of everything else. So there's a follow-up question uh, to that, uh, because um, by funding tech, there are different sorts of tech, mm -hmm. and there are technologies that are of use of, of all the other technologies that could grow up on it. For example, the, the Say It uh, Akumantoso technology for keeping transcripts of the parliament records and so on, that was part of my society's work, is mm -hmm. widely used by the Popolo Network, by very uh, many uh, other uh, governments and civic projects around. And, and there's also project funding, which specifically innovates around solving one specific problem or furthering a, a social mission. So is there any um, set quota or criteria or anything? And also uh, to follow up on your uh, uh, statement of the, is 50 uh, percent grant and 50 percent investment, was that a conscious choice or, or is there some other factors at play? Sure. But let me um, tackle the, the last part of that question first. So <clears throat> when I look across a media network um, and the five sectors that, that I mentioned earlier on, um, that's about 50-50 um, for profits, investments and grants. When we look at the governance and citizen engagement program, it's about 80% grants and about 20% for profit investments. Where we are seeing more for profit investments is in the civic tech space and in independent media. So we fund independent media, digital media platforms, and then we also fund um, civic tech for profits as well. So C-Click Fix in the US, people may have heard of, um, Colab um, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, people may have heard of. These are good examples of for profit companies that are selling into government. They're selling platforms which allow people to engage with government um, to you know, lodge complaints, to improve service delivery, and so on. So 80% of our funding through, through the governance and citizen engagement program is grants. Um, and 20% is, is for profit. In terms of core versus um, project funding, it kind of it depends. 
Um, we have given some very large core grants to organizations which we feel are sort of central to the ecosystem. So My Society, for example, um, we've given them a series of core grants um, over the last four or five years. Um, Open Contracting Partnership, um, we've given them um, core grants. And others, we've given project grants where we feel that maybe they need some, um, you know, they need some extra time to develop. They they need to. Um, there's one particular aspect of their work that they want to to develop further, and so on. Our preference, more generally, is to give flexible funding, because we also recognise. And you know, I speak as someone who's worked for an, for a non-profit, so I've sat on the other side of that table and tried to to sort of you know keep the lights on and pay the salaries and all the rest of it. So I recognise how critical core and flexible funding is. Um, so in most cases, it's our preference to give core funding because we recognize that um, this is something that organizations need. But in some cases, there may be also legal tax reasons why we can't give for core funding in some circumstances. We wish more um, donors would do it. Um, it is intensely frustrating when you sit around a table with other donors and speak to them um, and they say, oh no, our trustees wouldn't like it or we don't feel we can control the money or we wouldn't get enough reports. And we say, you know, the purpose of supporting these organizations is not to generate reports. You know, the purpose is to help them to grow and to develop. And you have to trust the management teams and the trustees to exercise that kind of oversight. So that's kind of our, our sort of starting position. Thank you. That's a very um, insightful answer. I should have said at the beginning that the questions are meant yeah. to be directed at Stephen, <laughs> not <please> me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but since nine people want me to answer. Well, um, the, the question was, uh, what has su most surprised me after moving into the government? Um, well, surprisingly, um, as much as there's enthusiasm and, as you describe, a certain of naivete uh, from the civil society and especially tech space around the promises of civic tech and open government engagements, there's an equal, if not more, amount of fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, inside the government from the career public servants who often see those um, themes as something that they don't fully understand, but uh, you know, politicians and legislators like it a lot, so there's a lot of pressure to del deliver, but they're not exactly sure what to do and so there's a lot of FUDs uh, and I think my work so far has been just to to lower the fear uncertainty and doubt and and invite the career public servants here uh, of which there are some here uh, and and showing that see this is a friendly community we won't bite and then we'll <laughs> help your <laughs> mission in, in lowering your risk and, and reducing your cost that's a, a short answer so do you have something to, to add to this about governmental cross-sectoral relationship yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a good question. Um, I mean, you're in a much stronger position than I am to to answer it. I think one thing that um, one has to be careful of, of course, and we've seen this happen once or twice, is is when you have a say a reform-minded mayor who takes over a city and then basically cannibalizes all of civil society and brings them on board. Um, so civil society organisations and developers are often strongest on the outside than they are in the inside. Now that's not to, to say that everybody has to resist working for government because, you know, as I said before, government essentially is, you know, the, is, is the most powerful agent of change. If, it's, um, if, 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 if the, the, their policies are, are appropriate and the way in which they're working is appropriate. But I think that co-option of civil society and the hacker movement you need to be careful of. Um, in situations where there perhaps isn't um, the overall enabling environment within government. But um, you know, I think a healthy moving backwards and forwards is always a good idea. Yeah, fellowships and so on are yeah. good ideas. At PIDIS here, we try not to hire more than one person from any particular NGO, mm -hmm. uh, so, so as to not to cannibalize things too much. So back to the, the grants and funding. So for all the project-based funding, what are you most proud of investing and or supporting? Do you have some examples? Um, I mean, this, this is kind of like, you know, which of your children do you, do you love best, really? Um, so it's, it's, it's not an easy question to, to answer, of course. Um, I mean, all of the 
you know, the organizations that we've supported through a media network, we've, you know, not all of them have been success. I mean, that's the other thing that's worth saying as well is that we've, we've made mistakes in, in, in funding projects and organizations that, that haven't survived and haven't um, succeeded. I think um, to call out some of the ones that are, I think, have shown greater traction over the years. Um, My Society, of course, is, is an organization which we've, we've supported for five or six years now and have been very proud of. Code for America, I think there's a couple of people here from Code for America. Um, again, a fantastic organization that we've, we've been heavily invested in. But then also some organizations working at a national level who've also been particularly effective. It was great to see Fioma here from, um, from Budeshi um, and or from PP DC. Um, and also there's Justin from Code for All, um, there's you know, Gavin from Open Contracting, there's people from Janagra. You know, I, I don't want to miss anybody out in the room, but uh, um, I think it's, the, the, these organizations I think have, have got great traction. They are locally rooted. Um, which I think is really important, um, and they are part of the community and often are a sort of hubs in the community as well. So um, I think the majority of the organizations that we've supported, I think we've been very pleased to have been support, uh, supportive of. Um, I think if I was to say that um, there are certain elements that we look for um, which um, uh, you know, perhaps characterize more successful organizations. I think number one is a kind of clarity of what they want to get done. Um, so if they're able to articulate that in a very convincing way, and it's not about making a pitch, it's, it's about having a clear idea of what success will look like in three or four or five years' time. Second, I think, is about strength of management team um, and also supportive trustees or governance structure and so on. Um, I think third, a sort of realism about how things change in their national context or the context in which they're trying to, to affect change, I think is something we look for. And then also the sort of networking that they do. Are they recognized by others? Are they admired by others as well? All of those kind of ingredients are things that we look for in successful organizations. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, and continuing that, that trend, um, so for all the networking, for all the grassroots movements and so on, do you see the civic tech itself as a sector? Uh, where do you see it moving toward, growing, shaping itself? Yeah, I mean, I think if we go back five years, people didn't talk about this as a sector. You know, no one, the, the, the term civic tech or gov tech really didn't exist at all. So that's, I think, evidence in a, in a way that a sector has, has grown up and has, has developed. Um, I think, obviously, the, the growth of technology, the growth of the mobile phone, um, the ability for people to access information around government services, um, an interest in holding government to account, I think is, is there now much more than it was five or, 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 or ten years ago. So I think that sort of combination, I think, has helped to seed this particular sector. And we did a, um, a review last year with um, a group called Purpose, um, which was called Engines of Change, which looked particularly at the US, but particularly looked at the growth of that sector and the kind of um, issues that, that, was the, that are going to emerge in the, in the coming years. I think there's two or three things I'd see, or we're starting to see. Um, number one is that it's internationalizing. And, you know, and I'm talking to a room here, which is predominantly people from this part of the world and from, from, from Asia. And I think where we may have seen the, the early roots of this in the UK or the US or Europe, I think what we've seen very quickly um, is other countries and other continents and regions which are catching up and a lot of innovation happening. So we're now seeing innovation in Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, which is then crossing over. So we've, we've just supported a, um, a challenge fund in Latin America run by the Avena Foundation called Outech, um, which has now supported about 30 different civic tech projects across Latin America. And there's things there which are replicable in any country in the world. And those are the kind of things I think that we, we look for and we start to see growing and developing. I think the second um, area which I think we're starting to see more, and maybe this has more of its roots in the current political situation in the US, is the sort of resistance um, movement and the sort of politicization of, of civic tech. 
um, particularly in the US. So I think we'll start to see more um, activist civic tech um, coming up, um, and particularly, as I say, we're, we're seeing this in the US. And then the third area, which um, again is, is of interest to us, is um, investors coming in to support for-profit companies as well. Um, so we were very much a kind of lone investor in this, in this kind of field, but we're now seeing more um, traditional venture capital funds, Andreas, Andreas and Horowitz, for example, Sequoia and others who are looking at investing um, in um, civic tech for-profits. Um, so I think the Engines of Change report showed that $250 million of new investing, investment funding came into civic tech and gov tech in the US last year. So that's a quite significant move forward. And again, for something that wasn't even defined as a sector five years ago, I think is, is, is really quite significant. So we're witnessing the sector building, and it's still um, yeah. <coughs> expanding the reach. Um, as with any social innovation uh, for investors who want to see a return uh, for uh, projects with double or triple bottom line, uh, the inevitable question is that how do you measure impact? What kind of metrics do you use? And by the metrics that, that you or your um, grantees want to use, uh, which has performed better in an organizational context? It is uh, a for-profit company or purely non-profits in the measure of those um, metrics? I mean, this is a really hard question, and it's really hard to try and find metrics to, to measure impact of, of civic tech. I think um, we, we look as for a combination of quantitative and qualitative metrics, um, and we are struggling with this, I think, as, as many of you do, as to kind of how you measure the impact of, of your platform, of, of your particular service, and so on. One is, a simple one is around users. And obviously, that's a you know value is gained by the number of people who download your app or who use it and distribute distribute information or who monitor parliamentarians or whatever. So that's a kind of clear one that we look for. Um, then the other more tricky one is about the kind of depth of engagement. You know, so um, anyone can kind of click on a on a on a site. You know, if we just wanted to go for numbers, you know, we've supported um, Wikimedia. You know, so there's there's kind of half a billion people straight away who kind of use that on a regular basis. But that's not what you call depth or of, of engagement. So what we try and do as much as possible with our investees is to come up with metrics which are relevant to them and to help them run their own business or to help them run their own organization and then try and roll them up ourselves into things that we are trying to measure as well. Um, and some of that will change, whether they're a national organization, whether they're monitoring parliament, whether they're trying to get users to civic complaint sites, um, or whether they're trying to work with government to, to, to make government services more accessible, and, and so on. Um, so uh, Code for America, for example, I know has been working on a, an, on a, uh, a, a program with the, uh, the state of California, which is about giving people better access to to subsidize food. So one and a half million people evidently in California are eligible for um, sub subsidized food, but they just don't know about it. So what they've done with, with um, I think, 58 counties now um, in California is to promote this and promote access to that kind of service. So that is impact. 30,000 people have used it. 30,000 people are now getting regular subsidized food, which they're entitled to. So that's one sort of very tangible thing that you can point to. Um, a group of, that we supported in Brazil called NOSAS, um, which um, has a branch called Moi Rio, um, is an organizing platform for citizens. I think they've now got about 600,000 members in 10 cities in Brazil. One very tangible thing they did was to work with the police in Rio to set up the first missing persons unit. So what they do is basically help people to, to develop campaigns using their tools, and then they interact with government to promote that particular service. So the success in that, uh, that um, particular example and the impact they had was that for the first time now, it's possible if you've um, lost or you're missing a relative or friend or whatever, is to get the police involved and to track that person and so on. So again, tangible impact. So I think it's a combination of those kind of breakthrough stories which will then give them traction and then a combination of the sort of qualitative and quantitative 
um, measurements that, that we will um, that we will look for. Um, in terms of which should pre perform better, um, I mean, obviously, when you've got for profits um, organisations, the you know return on investment is what you're looking for. You know, but we're also looking for social impact as well. So it's easier in many ways to do it for for profits because it's very clear that the value that you're getting is through people paying for a particular service, whether it's government or individuals. There's less tangible value um, f if you're a non profit um, because obviously, if we give a grant to a, um, a non profit, we're not expecting any return on investment, it's 100% loss of capital. But you know, you, often what you see is because of the, the, the roots within the community, the ability to mobilize and organize, non profits can sometimes have deeper impact than for profits. So it's not an exact science, and I don't think it's correct to sort of compare like with like, because obviously with for-profits, for you can generally get much larger scale um, if they're adopted and people will pay for them and so on. Um, so difficult question to answer. Mm -hmm. So they exist on, on, we would say, different levels, yeah. uh, but they support each other. So um, yeah, aside from the, the uh, very proposition that you talk about, there's very many very good stories around service delivery, around uh, mobilizing and so on. Um, do you have any other examples, not necessarily ones you invested in, that you would want the room of civic tech innovators to kind of look up to as like this is the civic impact that you would like to, them to, yeah. to get? I mean, I mean, again, this is very difficult to, to answer. And I think in a way you're, you're in a much better position to answer this than I am. Um, I mean, we've, I've, I've recounted a couple of examples um, there. Code for America's fellowships, for example, I think have been a good replicable example. I think the Alavatelli platform um, through My Society has been another fantastic replicable example of, 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 a, of, of a platform that is and a, an approach that's been used in, in many, many um, countries. So I think, again, going back to the kind of what are the ingredients for success, I think um, it's good management teams, it's innovative platforms, it's appropriate use of technology. Um, those are the kind of things which I think have, have the most impact. So are there gaps um, in your portfolio that you, you want to see filled? Like, are, are there issues either at the core infrastructure level or at the project level that you want to see more replicable results of? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think um, this, is, uh, this gathering, I think, is a, is a good example of the kind of things that we'd like to see. You know, um, the, another one which you know I'll call out as well is, is Personal Democracy Forum um, and the work that they've done in terms of convening the sector, um, and also the, the 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 role that tech hubs can play as well. We've been quite a, a proponent and supporter of, of tech hubs um, in many parts of the world as a way of actually convening the community. Co-creation hub in Lagos, in Nigeria, for example, has really single-handedly um, helped to create the ecosystem for um, technologists and civic tech in, in Nigeria. Um, and, and has also had an impact on the wider tech sector um, by you know, introducing um, high-speed fiber optic cable into a particular um, area of, of Lagos, which then created jobs which drew in businesses and so on. Um, Pandiyar in, in Myanmar, in Yangon, has been a great example of, of, of a way in which a particular community can be drawn together um, in, in perhaps a mo more unlikely setting. To, to really innovate uh, uh, around issues and problems that that country um, I I is tackling. So I think um, what, what this sector needs, I think, is, is more opportunities to learn from each other. And these, I think, are great um, examples of how, how that kind of learning can take place. Um, I think also, you know, and I'm sure Rebecca will agree with me, more research and proof points, um, because I think um, that's something that's also missing. When we did the Engines of Change report last year or the year before um, in the US, I think this was the very first time that anybody had tried to analyze the sector. So having a sort of sense of, of kind of, you know, what the universe looks like, what are the good case studies? What are the learnings from um, sort of various um, examples of, of civic tech, whether they be in Kenya or whether they be in, in Argentina or, or, or in India, I think is, is something that's, that's that we want to, to see more of because I think that will also help the sector grow. And then the other, you know, as I said at the very beginning, other donors and other investors coming in, I think is also critically important. 
All right. So there's plenty to do. Uh, are yeah. there any anything that you would call disruptive that you see coming in the in the next maybe three years in the civic tech sector, either because there's disruptive tech coming or disruptive political situation coming or anything disruptive that you would uh, describe or revolutionary? Yeah. Um, I mean, on on the political situation, I mean, I think we have seen, you know, uh, political winds of change happen in, in many parts of the world that perhaps we wouldn't have predicted um, three or four years ago. So um, I think that provides an opportunity for civic technologists to mobilize around political issues. Um, and as we were talking just before, I think, you know, th th there's, a, there's a fear perhaps of, of, of government um, or, uh, that sees the civic tech sector as being radical and anarchist. Um, that's sometimes the case, but that's kind of great. Um, and, but it's not always the case. And I think um, there is a, a way in which civic te technologists can work um, with government in a more seamless way, I think, which is, is to be encouraged. But as I said, I think there is also a role for s civic technologists to be in opposition and to be critical of government as well. And that really is, is something that's, that's really important as well, because I think wholesale co-option by government is wrong. Um, and I think the civic technologists have a, have a really strong role in being, being critical of government. So I think you know, there will be more, as the political context changes, and as we see more governments like we see in the US or the Philippines um, or Thailand or, or the UK or whatever, um, there is an opportunity to to sh help people understand that political context and help people organize. And then on the other hand, I think there is, as technology improves, as access to technology improves, as the user ex experience becomes easier and more seamless, then there is a role for civil civic technologists to work with government to deliver services like the, um, the Code for America, for example, in, in, in California, um, like a number of others um, where we're seeing technologists working with government to, to deliver services and deliver people's access to services and their rights to services um, in, in a more seamless way. So uh, this is the inevitable question that comes up every time there's a civic tech conference in the past year. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, um, when we talk about you know going viral or being very easily spread or accessible, uh, civic tech uh, does that, but uh, disinformation does that too. Um, and wh what do you think about disinformation? Is there anything in the civic tech sector that you see, whether there's the role in possibilities in handling them or in helping people to get more literacy or any other possibilities that you you see. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, I mean, the, the, the other thing I would take issue with is, is the term fake news. Um, I think um, misinformation, um, disinformation is probably more accurate. Um, um, there's a certain American politician, I think, who's now captured um, that term of, of, of fake yeah, news. I never use fake news. No. So, um, I mean, I think this is you know, both a role for the civic tech sector, it's also a role for um, the media as well to to tackle um, <clears throat> and I think um, it's also um, really important that social media companies um, take their responsibilities seriously as well I don't think it's possible for example for Facebook um, to say that it's no longer a publisher um, it, that it doesn't have editorial responsibilities um, it does um, and it needs to take those responsibilities seriously um, and so I think there is there is a role for, most importantly, I think, is for the um, technology companies to take their editorial responsibilities seriously and for them to do something about tackling misinformation, hate speech, um, and so on, on their platforms. That's the most important thing, I think, in this particular question. The second, I think, is for the mainstream media to um, improve the, um, the quality of information and news um, that um, is, is put out there. Um, and also to, to get people to understand that long-form analysis, editorial standards are important. 
um, and that it's not about sort of the number of clicks you get. It's not about the you know the ten stars with sailor light that you that you want to, to to look on. You know, it's about providing platforms for responsible news and also for accuracy and to return to to high editorial standards. That sounds very old fashioned, but I think you know news and 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 media based on veracity and information um, and accurate information is a really important um, core um, of, of, of a democratic society I think it is important also that civic the civic tech sector um, is used to to challenge um, what it sees as mis misinformation and also to challenge hate speech we've seen again in Myanmar some some fantastic examples of where the civic tech sector and Pandiyar has been the, the the core of that and the convenient of that has produced ways in which people can challenge um, misinformation and hate speech in those communities and that's particularly important when you look at what's going on in in Myanmar at the moment so I think the civic tech sector I think is a really important role in in that I think also we're starting to see important innovation around um, fact-checking as well and fact-checking is both a problem and a solution um, because there's a lot of concerns about fact-checking um, that actually amplifies the lie in the first place um, but then there are also quite a lot of innovation um, about um, that's going on around more immediate and real-time fact-checking which I think um, is one part of, of, of the solution as well so I think the civic tech, civic tech sector does play an important role um, in challenging misinformation hate speech and so on but I think you know if I was to put in the hierarchy of responsibilities I would say the technology companies are the first port of call mainstream media are the second um, and then I think the civic tech um, uh, community can help um, to, to challenge some of those issues. That's, that's great. Um, so uh, Gavin Heyman would like to ask, ever, do you ever had any investment in particular you think was particularly belly wrong or fell flat? And what are the lessons learned? Yeah, plenty. Um, and um, I mean, yeah, we, we have invested and given grants to organizations that have failed. Um, and you know, I won't name names because I don't think it's fair really to do that in a, in a public forum but um, there are examples where I think um, <clears throat> there's been mismanagement and we've taken um, promises at face value we haven't monitored closely enough um, what has been the, um, the traction of that particular organization or, or innovation and we've sometimes been wowed by you know, fantastic pitches and ideas where there hasn't been a great deal of, of evidence. So, so yeah, we've, we've had our fair share of, of, of failures and, and I think we've also contributed in some ways to those failures. Um, <clears throat> I think the important thing is, is let's learn from those mistakes and I think we're now maybe with sort of 10 years of experience are able to, to spot some of the charlatans sometimes that, that come across our desk and, and also to, to make sure that we, as we've grown our networks um, over the last 10 years, is to go to trusted people and say, well, what do you think? So if, if there's a, a group that comes to us you know, in South Africa or whatever, I know there's four or five people I can ask and say, okay, just give me a sense of, of what they're like and you know, is this likely to succeed and so on. Um, so, so yeah, no, we, we've, we've certainly backed some turkeys. All right. Um, so, yeah, what, what are the challenges you encountered? As you mentioned, the international linking of replicable uh, methodologies and so on very important among people in dispersed places. What are the challenges you found in doing this? Um, I mean, I think, you know, the, the main one is just time. Is that, I mean, you know, this is great for people to come together and spend, you know, three days here in, in Taipei. But, you know, it's taking some people a day to get here or take you a day to get back. That's a week. Um, out of out of your, your your lives and inevitably work piles up you don't have the time to to invest in this kind of you know important networking opportunities so I think that's that's the main thing um, I think also we've tried to to uh, so, you know convene groups ourselves um, and I think that we've also got to be aware of the dynamic when we do it um, is that you know at one point we used to bring all of our um, investees and grantees to once a year to a, uh, you know, what we thought was a fantastic learning um, opportunity in California and they'd come over for two, three days. And then we also realized that they're gonna come. 
because that's all part of donor relations. You know, if if they don't come, you know, we'd be saying, well, kind of, where are those people from my society? You know, I mean, that's a little kind of ungrateful of them, and so on. So, so I think it's not really our role to do those kind of convenings because there's a different dynamic at work. Um, so I think these kind of things, you know, we, 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 we're really encouraged by. And I think, as I say, if you can get it into a sort of cycle where, you know, PD, PDF, for example, started in New York and has now have had a very um, uh, successful spin-off, um, which has happened in, in Poland for the last three or four years. Um, I see someone from uh, um, the EPF, I think, uh, probably there at the, uh, the back. Um, so, so if you get it into people's calendars, and people will attend if they see value in attending. Um, but that's, that, I think, is the main challenge. And there's been other opportunities or uh, things that people have done where they've tried to form um, sort of virtual groups and so on. And, and kind of that doesn't really work, I don't think, because people have other things to do in their lives. So. Yeah, we're still working on virtual reality technology, so it will take a couple of years. So um, grants are inevitably time limited. You talk about a little bit about grant dependency, of course, and about the integrity, which is why you don't convene those uh, events purely by yourself, which is very wise. Uh, so, but how how can Civitec in general transition from a grant de dependency into something that's more self-sustained, either in its MPO form or if it's a company in its sustainable business model form? I mean, one of the things we do try and look for um, with nonprofits um, that we support is, <clears throat> is they have diverse funding. So we have a sort of rule ourselves, and I was meeting with somebody from another foundation um, in London um, last week, and they were, have the same one, which is we will never be more than 25% of an organization's annual funding um, because it creates that dependency. And if, for whatever reason, uh, there was a change in our approaches or philosophy or whatever, that could be very risky if you sort of essentially own um, an organization um, with, with a much larger, um, uh, you know, a, a much larger, a larger level of support. So I think having diversifi diversification in funding sources is really important. And as much as possible to try and get earned revenue sources as part of, of that diversification. And that's really difficult um, because, again, some uh, organizations, what they're set up to do, you're not going to earn revenue. Some of them are public goods. Um, you know, uh, it's, it, it is you know, parliamentary monitoring. You're not going to earn an awful lot of revenue out of that, I don't think. But if you can get you know, a combination of crowdfunding, if you combination of um, you know, fees for services, for consultancy contracts, then if you've got a diversification away from one single overwhelming source, then that, I think, is, is kind of healthy. Um, we don't have a, a solution to how nonprofits become sustainable. Um, I think it's, it's really hard. Um, you, it's, it's something that everybody struggles with and everybody finds difficult. Um, so it is something where we potentially could help to invest more in, in helping people to, to learn more about that and to, to support that kind of business development side of it. Um, in terms of the for-profits, you know, that's reasonably easy. You know, if they provide value, people will pay for it or, or institutions will pay for it. If they don't, then they will fail. All right, so um, so there's a <coughs> a observation that uh, the Omidia Network uh, mostly invests on more proven or at least partware there uh, groups, and instead of on um, very small organizations of just one or three people, uh, is there a a possibility of considering a smaller scale grant? Um, we, we we have funded smaller initiatives through um, uh, you know th through sort of second or third party funding mechanism. So I mentioned our tech in Latin America as an example of that, where um, <clears throat> we've given the Avena Foundation, um, uh, which is a Latin American foundation, two and a half million dollars to re-grant to smaller um, organizations. We just don't have the capacity to give very small grants. Um, we do have now more of a capacity to do kind of rapid reaction grants. So if there is a particular crisis, um, there's a particular need that an organization is trying to, to tackle. We've also um, introduced something called network grants. So within our existing investees, or ones that are um, uh, alumni of, um, of, of the Midian network, there is a, a, an opportunity to club together and to put forward ideas for project grants, which will attract sort of $50,000 worth of, of funding. Um, but probably our place in the market is to provide the more substantial 
larger funding. Um, and there are many other organizations that do provide very small amounts of funding. Awesome. Um, so yeah, are there any messages that you would want the persons or companies uh, going to you uh, to know, uh, preferably before even <laughs> uh, entering your door, uh, that are there any overarching values or, or things that you would like them to know? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier on. It's in terms of clarity of vision, having a kind of very clear idea of, of, of what um, they, they're they trying to achieve. Um, I think it's about um, also having some funding already, so, you know, or having a little bit of a track record and having some traction. Um, so it's rare that we just support organizations just at concept stage. Um, <clears throat> I think it's also, you know, doing research and having a look at what other organizations we support. Um, so you will then get a sense from looking at our website, looking, talking to people within the network, uh, the, the, for the you know the ideas as to things that are likely to 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 um, uh, you know so to, to fall on, um, on 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 more sort of you know uh, on beneficial ground. Um, so I think that that's the main thing. I think the other thing to say is that um, we advertise on our on our site that you know we don't take unsolicited. Um, you know, approaches, and that every large foundation does that. Um, but also, we are open to ideas. Um, so, you know, please don't mob me afterwards, but um, please do email me or get in touch with my colleagues, and, you know, we can talk about ideas that people have, particular innovations and so on. I can't promise that we'll support them. The other thing is that we do tend to work in relatively limited geographical areas in most cases. Um, so in sub-Saharan Africa, it's Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa. Um, in Asia, it is India, and it's in Myanmar and the Philippines. In Latin America, it's Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia. Um, and then also we do some limited work in Western Europe. Um, Eastern Europe, it's Ukraine and Poland. Um, and have I missed anywhere? And the US. Um, however, um, that, that's our kind of main rule. But if there is there's, there's a fantastic replicable idea from Mozambique that's going to completely change the world, we're not going to say, no, we're not going to look at it. Awesome. Um, Julia K. Koiba, perhaps, uh, asks, uh, do you encourage organizations to share fails and things that have not worked out? You talk about your, your own experience in weeding out charlatans and so on, but what about you know, those honest trying and then failing uh, teams? Do you encourage them to share post-mortems and so on? Yes, yeah, so as much as possible, although people find this difficult, um, and also we need to be conscious of, of how you do it, do it. I mean, it, it's kind of admirable in many ways that people are willing to be honest. And you know, you read a lot about kind of fail fests and, and so on. Um, but also, you know, if I was an organization and I was talking to donors, I wouldn't want to be going in with, you know, let me tell you how I failed. You know, it's, it's kind of not natural to do that. So I think there's a time and the place for, for sharing failures. Um, and I think as long as the organization internally learns from its mistakes, it's the, that's the most important thing. If they then feel that they're seeing other organizations in a similar situation, and they say, okay, why don't we share what we've learned about parliamentary monitoring or civic complaint sites, and these are the things we found that worked, and these are the things we found that didn't, then that's great. I think kind of putting it out there in a big public forum is, is much more difficult. All right, so we have another 10 minutes or so. Um, so what about academics? We haven't been talking about them much, but how do you uh, find the research uh, which has been growing in numbers in the past couple of years about the impact of civic tech uh, in your work? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's critical, and there, as I said before, there isn't enough of it. Um, so we've um, funded a couple of studies um, one which, for example, was about the use of open data, sort of, and where we've we've tended to to to, to fund that work has been around case studies, rather than kind of longitudinal research. Um, we are about to do a sort of major retrospective next year into the civic tech community. So really, which is an eva we're going to get an outside evaluator to to look at our portfolio and to see what we've done and what we could have done better. So um, that's more of a sort of, you know, this is what a media network has done and what, what it could have done better. So um, our experience of funding this, this kind of work to date has been mainly around collections of case studies um, rather than um, either regional or 
um, sort of uh, global research into the sector. Um, we need to do more of it. Yeah, it's still a young sector. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so Matthew would like to ask, in addition to the clar clarity of vision and so on, which is the more overarching suggestion, are there any like everyday practices uh, that you would wish the civic organizations incorporated into your projects? Um, I mean, I think uh, there's some sort of organizational um, qualities, I think, which um, are, <clears throat> are good for organizations to, to adopt. Um, one, I think, is um, a commitment to measuring impact and a commitment to, to look at, uh, at, at yeah, firstly, how you gather that data, how you gather that sort of information. Because I think all donors will want to know what impact have you had, how can you show it, and how can you illustrate it. So I think that's, that's kind of one thing which we, we do look for. Um, I think the other thing is um, a sort of costs that are proportionate to what they're trying to, to do. And I'm not suggesting that the civic tech sector <clears throat> has, you know, pay, you know, pays itself ridiculously high salaries. That's not the case at all. But um, a lot of, and a lot of organizations, however, are virtual organizations. And that brings with it some tensions and some difficulties in <clears throat> organizational culture. Um, so I think a recognition of that and some way of learning how to mitigate that is really important. So, so when we go back to the earlier question was around organizations that have failed, I think w w there's been a couple of, of examples that of organizations that we've backed that have failed, uh, partly because they haven't spent time creating an organizational culture. Now, that doesn't mean they have to have an office, um, but if, it, if they don't have an office, then they need to get together on a reasonably regular basis, because it sounds Yes, uh, great to say yes, no, we just we contact each other on Skype. But there's a lot of um, tensions and friction um, that can occur when you don't meet up reasonably regularly. Um, now, we also recognize that there's a, there's a cost to that. If you've got a global organization with people, you know, five or six different um, places, then it's costly to bring people together. But <clears throat> I think doing that at least a few times a year is, is really important. So, so pay, pay some attention to organizational culture and communications, I think, is, is, is really important. Um, and also sort of clear lines of accountability. I mean, it, it sounds trite to say so, but so many organizations say, oh, no, we're fine, we're just four founders, you know. Um, and yeah, but kind of that doesn't really work, you know. Um, someone has got to be held accountable for submitting the accounts. Someone's got to be held accountable for, you know, doing the tech, etc. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a massive corporate hierarchy, but it does mean that you need to have some kind of clarity about who reports to who, who's accountable for what, and so on. So, so those are kind of things I think I, it, there is a sort of balance between being anarchic um, and so on, and then also getting stuff done. Yeah. yeah, well, in any anarchist network, there's a cabal or many cabals. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're down to our maybe last two or three questions. Um, how do we do to keep the motivation in civic projects? Because many of them are long term projects and it, it does take a while to get there. Yeah, no, this, this is a good question. I think <clears throat> it's about celebrating success and doing it in you know, meetings like this and convenings like this. Um, and then it's also. Um, about keeping focused on what you're trying to change and who you're trying to change. And if it is working with either it's local government or you know, a city or national level, I think it's about you know, creating appropriate coalitions to, to, to keep you focused on that end goal. Um, so you know, people will find motivation from lots of different things, but obviously you're gonna get motivated when you see sm even small successes. Um, so it's about celebrating those, recognizing those, and sort of you know, continue to carry on to, to, to sort of try and meet the overall objectives. So um, are, the, are you aware of any incubating or accelerating funds to help civic hackers to run and sustain organization with good governance? Because many civic hackers <laughs> doesn't have that as their organization core skills. And, and it's traditionally in the traditional VC world that the role of an incubator or whatever to do it. Mm. I mean, I think this, is, this comes back to the kind of tech hubs 
idea. So um, there are some that do it well and some that don't. Um, and there are some also that are just co-working spaces. So I think you know, when we talk about tech hubs, there's a, you know, a, a range of different um, examples. As I say, I mean, the couple that I, I mentioned earlier on, Co-Creation Hub um, in, in Nigeria, Civic Hall um, in New York, um, uh, Pandiyar in, in, in Yangon are good examples that I'm aware of, which provide that incubation function um, as well as a community support function and a place just to hang out as well. So um, I don't think there's, I wouldn't say there are, there are that many, and it's something that probably, you know, somebody with some couple of good ideas could help set up. Um, but to, to, and I think there is a different incubation and acceleration means something different in the for-profit world. Um, and than it does in the non-profit world. And I think um, the ones that I've mentioned, you know, CC Hub, Civic Hall, and Pandiyar, I think do both quite well. Um, most of the incubators and accelerators, of course, are just focusing on startups, on for-profit startups. Um, some of them are starting to think about the civic tech problems that startups can tackle. There's one in the UK called Zinc, for example, which is, is looking, it's again taking the, looking at, at tackling a particular problem and going deep into that problem rather than saying, we are open to civic tech. They're saying, okay, we're open, to, we, uh, the issue we're gonna focus on is women's education. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is bring together academics, problem solvers, policy makers in government, um, startups, developers and so on. So that's another way of tackling it, is to go for the idea and then, it, then incubate around the idea rather than the kind of broad whatever civic tech is. That's great. So um, actually we're at time. Are, are there any questions from the audience that, yeah, verbally? <laughs> um, just one question, thank you. So with my four years, or five years of experience in uh, working in civic tech organizations, at times I start to feel a bit lonely, you know. Uh, but what I see of late, particularly this is the case with India and maybe in other developing nations, there is a large, uh, lot of interest on tech for good. And a lot of developers are moving into that segment. There is a lot of social consciousness, a lot of... Uh, investments flowing in from impact investors, and these are uh, uh, solving problems, not exactly civic tech in terms of interaction with government, but uh, uh, all the surrounding ecosystem problems are being looked into and solved. Is that a good uh, way to link out to a tech for good sector, to, I mean, uh, between civic tech and tech for good? Is there an opportunity? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's, as I said before, I think it's, um, if, you can, if you can get support from a variety of different sectors, whether it's government, whether it's policy makers, whether it's the VC community, whether it's foundations or whatever, I think there are, you know, the, the, there are many people who are interested in this particular sector. So, you, you know, many of the people in this room, you know, didn't start off working for nonprofits and then suddenly you know, got technology. Most of the people in this room got technology and then started getting interested in, in civic um, aspects of that. So I think it's about how do you build bridges between those different communities and meetings like this are good examples. National level meetings are good examples. The tech hubs are good ways in which you can bring people together. And also to encourage government to take this particular um, use of technology seriously and to convince them that it will have benefits for their society. Sometimes when we, we think of government as being the sort of the blank wall of opposition. Um, but in most cases, if you talk to politicians and you talk to them, number one, they want to be associated with the kind of white heat of technology. It's trendy and, and, and so on. I remember when we supported the iHub in Nairobi, um, it, the, you could, every week, there would be some UN Secretary General or somebody from the EU coming through because they wanted to be associated with what they saw as kind of African technology technology sort of momentum and so on. So from a political point of view, I think it's attractive. Um, and also, you know, if you say to anybody in government, let me show you how you, we can get you closer to, your, um, to the, the, the beneficiaries and the people you're trying to help at a fraction of the cost, you're going to be welcome with, with open arms. So I think the need, more needs to be done to sort of explain to government about the benefits of working with the technology sector. Um, 
but you know, that is a kind of broad coalition. It involves nonprofits, it involves technologists, it involves you know, companies as well. So I think you know, there's, there's plenty for many in the community to do here. Uh, with, yeah. Um, yeah, and let us thank Stephen again for a very insightful conversation, and let's continue this conversation online, on Twitter, email, whatever, anywhere. So, yeah, thank you all. Okay, so... Uh,